Candace Owens speaks at the House hearing on white nationalism and hate crimes. In this video, we have just the portions where Candace Owens was speaking at the House hearing, with some context from other people. For the entire uncut House hearing video, see the links below, and also see the links below called Proud Boys Slandered in Congress House Hearing on White Nationalism and Hate Crimes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Mr. Collins, uh, thank you for having me here today. I received word on my way in that many of the journalists were confused as to why I was invited, and none of them knew uh, that I myself uh, was the victim of a hate crime when I was in high school. That's something that very few people know about me uh, because the media and the journalists and the left are not interested in telling the truth about me because I don't fit the stereotype of what they like to see in black people. I'm a Democrat, I support the President of the United States, and I advocate for things that are actually affecting the black community. I'm honored to be here today in front of you all because the person sitting behind me is my 75-year-old grandfather. I've always considered myself to be my grandfather's child, and I mean to say that my sense of humor, my passion, and my work ethic all comes from the man that is sitting behind me. My grandfather grew up on a sharecropping farm in the segregated South. He grew up in an America where words like racism and white nationalism held real meaning under the Democrat Party's Jim Crow laws. My grandfather's first job was given to him at the age of five years old, and his job was to lay tobacco out to dry in an attic in the South. My grandfather has picked cotton, and he has also had experiences with a Democrat terrorist organization of that time, the Ku Klux Klan. They would regularly visit his home and they would shoot bullets into it. They had an issue with his father, my great-grandfather. During my formative years, I had the privilege of growing up in my grandfather's home. It's going to shock the committee, but not once, not in a single breath of a conversation, did my grandfather tell me that I could not do something because of my skin color. Not once did my grandfather hold a gripe against the white man. I was simply never taught to view myself as a victim because of my heritage. I, I learned about faith in God, family, and hard work. Those were the only lessons of my childhood. There isn't a single adult today that in good conscience would make the argument that America is a more racist or a more white nationalist society than it was when my grandfather was growing up. And yet we're hearing these terms sent around today because what they want to say is that brown people need to be scared, which seems to be the narrative that we hear every four years right ahead of a presidential election. Here are some things we never hear. 75% of the black boys in California don't meet state reading standards. In inner cities like Baltimore, within five high schools and one middle school, not a single student was found to be proficient in math or reading in 2016. The single, mother would, the single motherhood rate in the black community, which was at 23% in the 1960s when my grandfather was coming up, is at a staggering 74% today. I am guessing there will be no committee hearings about that. There are more black babies born, there are more black babies aborted than born alive in cities like New York, and you have Democrat Governor Andrew Cuomo lighting up buildings to celebrate late-term abortions. I could go on and on, but my point is that White nationalism, white nationalism did not do any of those things that I just brought up. Democrat policies did. Let me be clear. The hearing today is not about white nationalism or hate crimes. It's about fear-mongering, power, and control. It's a preview of a Democrat 2020 election strategy, same as the Democrat 2016 election strategy. They blame Facebook, they blame Google, they blame Twitter. Really, they blame the birth of social media, which has disrupted their monopoly on minds. They called this hearing because they believe that if it wasn't for social media, voices like mine would never exist, that my movement Blexit, which is inspiring black Americans to lead, to lead the Democrat Party, would have never come about. And they certainly believe that Donald Trump would not be in office today. Looking on the next thing to focus on now that the Russian collusion hoax has fallen apart. What they won't tell you about this, the statistics and the rise of white nationalism is that they've simply changed the data set points by widening the definition of hate crimes and upping the number of reporting agencies that are able to report on them. What I mean to say is that they're manipulating statistics. The goal here is to scare blacks, Hispanics, gays, and Muslims into helping them, center dissent, helping them censor dissenting opinions, ultimately into helping them regain control of our country's narrative, which they feel that they lost. They feel that President Donald Trump should not have beat Hillary. If they actually were concerned about white nationalism, they would be holding hearings on Antifa, a far-left, violent, white gang who determined one day in Philadelphia in August that I, a black woman, was not fit to sit in a restaurant. They chased me out. They yelled race traitor to a group of black and Hispanic police officers who formed a line to protect me from their ongoing assaults. 
They threw water at me, they threw eggs at me, and the leftist media remained silent on it. If they were serious about the rise of hate crimes, we may, they may perhaps be examining themselves and the hate that they have drummed up in this country. Bottom line is that white supremacy, racism, nas white nationalism, words that once held real meaning have now become nothing more than election strategies. Every four years, the black community is offered handouts and fear. Handouts and fear. Reparations and white nationalism. This is the Democrat preview. Of course, society is not perfectible. We've heard testimony of that today. There are pockets of evil that exist, and those things are horrible, and they should be condemned. But I believe the legacy and the ancestry of black Americans is being insulted every single day. I will not pretend to be a victim in this country, and I know that that makes many people on the left uncomfortable. I want to talk about real issues in black America. I want to talk about real issues in this country and real concerns. The biggest scandal, this is my last sentence, in American politics is that Democrats have been conning minorities into belief that we are perpetual victims, all but ensuring our failure. Racial division and class warfare are central to the Democrat Party platform. They need blacks to hate whites, the rich to hate the poor, and soon enough it'll be the tall hating the short. The time of the witness has expired. I do want to go back to Ms. Owens for a second. You made a statement at the very beginning of why you were here, and I think the victim of, uh, if you've heard your story and there's been, you've told that story many times, but if you would share how that's affected your view as you go forward and the issues that you're wanting to address today. Uh, certainly. So when I was speaking about different classifications of hate crimes, which actually has increased and obviously impacts statistics. Um, my, when I was in high school, um, I received a slew of messages um, from the Democrat governor of Connecticut's son, um, Mr. Daniel Malloy. Um, and at the time, he was the mayor of Stanford. And um, his son, along with three other boys, referred to me as the N-word, uh, threatened to tar and feather my family and put a bullet in the back of my head like, like they did to Martin Luther King. This is a story that's not often spoken about. Um, because the media has no interest in telling the truth about how it's formed my views towards conservatism. Um, the media turned it into a firestorm and it became a, a political tool for people to gain power. The NAACP uh, used me at that time, uh, it would just meet me outside of the school with cameras in tow uh, to speak out against the crimes. Of course, now I'm older and I realize that that's really just a fundraising mechanism and that a lot of these groups survive because they cannot have the problem fixed ever. The NAACP never wants racism to go away. Um, bottom line, all I was looking for at that time was an apology. Uh, the youngest person in that car was 14 years old. Um, and I understand that human beings can make mistakes and do stupid things. Uh, but we're not in a society anymore where an apology is good enough. And we're obsessed with labels. We're obsessed with labeling people as racist, as they did to those young boys. And it simultaneous, simultaneously impacted me as a victim. It's not fun to be a victim. And um, I, I'm, I'm adamantly against victimhood, and I speak out to the black community about how it ultimately harms us. Uh, Ms. Owens, let me begin with you, if I can. Um, I think it's fair to say that you didn't start off on the conservative side of the ledger. Is that correct? That's correct. I was a liberal. Okay. And uh, so just on a couple of issues, and you mentioned them in, in your statement, but just to go back to them, if you could uh, tell us again kind of what they are and, and what um, what hatred that you've experienced as a result of having this point of view. Um, you mentioned the term uh, Blexit. Would you describe what that is and what hate that you've experienced as a result of your position on that? Um, I launched a movement called Blexit, which is the black exit from the Democrat Party. Um, when I became educated about the issues and stopped reacting emotionally, which is what the left wants us to do, presumably, when they hold up pictures of burning churches. Candace here is referring to this, which happened a few minutes earlier. The chairman, chairman, the lady has expired. Uh, burning churches. Thank you. When I became educated about the issues and stopped reacting emotionally, which is what the left wants us to do, presumably, when they hold up pictures of burning churches, I began to examine the facts and, and look at some of the narratives they were spinning. For example, in 2016, it was police brutality, and I realized that they are dissuading us against um, our own best interests. And I wanted to have a more productive dialogue with the black community about the issues that are actually affecting us and impacting us. When I announced that I was a conservative, I've never seen anything more racist, more disgusting, more vitriolic, and more hate that's come my way in my entire life than the things that Democrats um, and the media say about me today. I've been referred to as an Uncle Tom, a bed wench. For those of you that don't know, that means a slave that sleeps with the master. Um, and these are all words that have been said over and over again about black conservatives when they have the audacity to think for themselves and become educated about our history and the myth of things um, like the Southern switch and the Southern strategy, which never happened.
You mentioned, I think, on, uh, well, let me ask you this. I think you did on, on the life issue. Uh, you're you're pro-life. Is that is that accurate? And That's correct. And I started off pro-choice. And what, what sort of uh, hatred, if any, have you experienced or do you get? Well, that, that hate tends to come uh, majority from uh, Caucasian Democrats. Um, when I start telling the truth about the fact that the community that is the most impacted by abortion is the black community. Uh, 800 to 900 black babies are aborted every single day. Uh, that amounts to about 18 million black babies aborted since 1973. And the black population has stagnated. Uh, we are not, our population growth has stagnated completely. These are the kinds of logical discussions that I've had that have earned me all the titles that we discussed before. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Buck, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Owens, I'm going to direct these questions to you, if I may. Uh, I don't know that you've seen this, but it's a memorandum that the majority uh, Democrats prepare for uh, the committee members. And in this memorandum, they uh, go through the various witness names and organizations that they represent, uh, the Anti-Defamation League, Legal Justice Society, the uh, uh, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, and then we get to you. Oh my goodness. Candace Owens, Director of Communications at the Conservative Nobody else is described as progressive or liberal, but you are described as a conservative advocacy group, Turning Point USA, and a conservative commentator and political activist known for her criticism of Black Lives Matter and the Democrat Party. Um, I, I think you've caused my friends on the left to, to go to their safe spaces, and I'd love to ex uh, explore with you a little bit of the reason for that. Um, do you consider yourself a conservative? I am a conservative, yes. Okay. Are you pro-life? I am pro-life. Okay. Does that trigger people when you see them, that they know that you're pro-life? It makes them very upset, and okay. Democrats hate me. Uh, do you own a gun? Pardon? Do you own a gun? No, sir. When next time you come to Colorado, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll take you shooting. Are, are you a Christian? Yes, I am. Uh, are you proud of your family? I'm very proud of my family. Okay. Um, let me ask you something. Do you hate Americans with black skin color? Uh, absolutely not. I actually love Americans with black skin color so much that I'm willing to fall on the sword a thousand times for them to wake up and realize that we are being lied to, abused, and used by the Democrat Party. How about Americans with white skin color? Do you hate them? I do not, and that's a problem for people on the left. Do you hate uh, Hispanics? I do not. Do you hate uh, uh, Asians? I do not. Um, do you hate lesbians or gays or anybody from the LGBTQ community? Nope, I've got all of that in my family. <laughs> I'm baffled because in the chairman's opening statement, he said that you openly associate with purveyors of hate. Yes, um, purveyors of hate, by his definition, is anybody that supports the president. I support the president because he's done a tremendous job in helping the black community, despite all of the rhetoric from the media and leftists so, who do so, not want him to be successful. Tell me a little bit about how the president has helped the black community, if you would, please. Well, he's lowered the black unemployment rate. It's the lowest it's ever been in the history. Uh, he's getting us off of our feet. We see, uh, I believe the last number I checked was 3.5 million people are off of food stamps, something that the black caucus sat down and didn't applaud. Neither did any of the Democrats applaud uh, because they want a system where blacks are dependent on the government. Uh, uh, they, they are the people that put in place the policies that broke down the black family. And the biggest problem that's facing our community is father absence. Um, in every room that I've been in with the president, he talks about real issues and he doesn't pander to us. He doesn't do Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's southern drawl accent and speaking to us like we're slaves. He asks us important questions. And the most important question he could have asked was, Black America, what do you have to lose? Because we were already losing under Democrat leadership. Do you, do you believe that you openly associate with purveyors of hate? I absolutely do not. I have, I have no tolerance for hate whatsoever. Do you believe that college campuses should be open uh, discussions uh, or there should be open discussions on college campuses for various issues? I absolutely do. You know, I do a campus tour tonight. I'm flying up to University of Connecticut to continue that. And we are being met with uh, aggressive <coughs> leftist groups. Uh, three Antifa chapters have declared they're going to try to shut it down. And uh, we face this violence every day on the left and nobody ever wants to talk about it. And I, I guess what I was going to ask you, um, you, you went on to explain it before I got a chance to, but have you ever been disinvited from uh, uh, speech opportunities at college campuses because of your conservative views? All the time. Um, and, is that a form of hatred, do you think? Of course it is. And we're not talking enough about political hatred in this country. We're not talking enough about conservative activists being attacked like myself. Uh, we had a student whose dorm was set on fire. Uh, for being a member of the Turning Point chapter. And all we preach is for free markets and capitalism as, as a means to lift the most people out of poverty. 
That is my belief. And of course, my main thesis is that black people do not have to be Democrats and we are not owned by the left. And I understand that that causes some people trouble. So as a conservative, you've attended many conservative events and, and uh, visited with many conservatives. Um, and I, I am not denying for a moment that there are white supremacists and we should condemn white supremacists, that there are Nazis and we should condemn Nazis, uh, that there are hateful groups all across the political spectrum and we should condemn those. But in your uh, interactions with conservatives, have you seen hateful speech, uh, bigotry, racism among the conservatives that you've associated with? Um, I, I speak in front of conservatives probably three times a week. I jump on a stage and I say everything pro-black. Um, and they are so supportive and they applaud. All they want is for black Americans to realize that they are Americans first and foremost. Conservatives are patriots. The president is a patriot and I'm a patriot. And there is no skin color in patriotism. Thank God we have you. Thank you very much for being here. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Biggs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I ask unanimous consent to include in the record a list of political violence perpetrated or promoted by leftist organizations. Without objection. Thank you. And uh, I also, you know, I'm, I'm riffing um, on something that, that Mr. Buck, gentleman from Colorado, was talking about. But in the listing of witnesses in the chairman's memo, it did something I've not seen in my brief time in Congress or indeed in my many years of legislative service in my home state. That is an editorial comment about a witness. Some might even consider that this not so subtle editorializing is in of itself an indicia of animus. It's unfortunate, but it demonstrates how easy it is to let one's bias appear even in what is supposed to be an innocuous listing of witnesses Would for the this gentleman hearing. Yield? Yes, I will yield, sir. I assume you're, uh, uh, you're referring to uh, what is written about uh, Candace Owens, where it says, She's a director of communications at the conservative advocacy group Turning Point USA and a conservative commentator and political activist known for her criticism of Black Lives Matter and, and of the Democratic Party. I don't think she could quarrel with the accuracy of that. It's a simple statement of who she is. But, reclaiming my time. What I will say about this is you never, ever see anybody characterized in any other list of witnesses. This is the first time I've ever seen that other than the stating what they represent or the group that they are from. This is seemingly, seemingly anyway, going beyond the bounds of what is the norm. That is an indication to me of how easy it is to demonstrate animus. And, and the, so it means for a logical question of Ms. Owens, which she's already addressed to some respect is, as you talk, Ms. Owens, and you go to universities, like I'm going to go to UConn tonight, do you receive hate speech directed at you? All the time, and I really do feel that the media on the left has made it okay. And I do just want to add that my biography, which I submitted, uh, you reduced it to one sentence, uh, uh, calling me a, a, just a conservative activist, and it wasn't what I said or what I submitted um, to your office last night. And, are the, and I, I just think that you opened with anti-black bias, and I see it coming from the chairman today. And Ms. Owens. These efforts to shut you down when you speak publicly on issues that you care about under the protection of the First Amendment, are they peaceful? No, they're, they're really scary. Uh, they threaten us online perpetually. I receive threatening letters to my home uh, when the media drums up narratives and pretends that I hate black people or that I hate gays or that I hate Muslims uh, with no evidence supporting any of those claims. What they're inviting is for people to think it's okay to be violent towards me when they see me. They want to make it an act of virtue for people to be violent towards black conservatives that are outspoken. And there are on occasion false accusations and staged hate crimes. Um, what impact do those have on actual real hate crimes? It makes it harder, I think, for people to come forward or for people to believe it. Um, I don't see enough condemning of what Jesse Smollett did uh, what, to this nation in, in terms of tearing us apart and, and causing a debate. And obviously the left was quick to believe him and put him on a platform despite absolutely no evidence. Um, and it just makes it harder. Again, it just makes it harder for us to come together as a nation, which I think is what the president uh, is trying to do, bring everybody together. And Ms. Owens, are you familiar with the case of Isabella Chow, who is a uh, UC Berkeley senator who was harassed because of a position to, she took? I'm not. Well, Ms. Chow took a position of basically abstaining from a vote due to religious concerns and was harassed out of her position. And she was uh, hate speech galore 
all arising and, and going forward. So it, it isn't that, that there isn't hate speech. It's that th we need to condemn all hate speech. That, Your that's thoughts? correct. I, I definitely agree. We need to condemn all hate speech. There's only one type of hate speech like that, that they like to talk about and give a platform to. Um, it, there is a double standard in this country, and that double standard, I think, is being felt the most by black conservatives, uh, the Jewish community, and Christians. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stubbe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would love to see my Democratic colleagues condemn anti-Semitism. I have a resolution that I have filed. Um, one of their own members of their own caucus have said very racist anti-Semitic remarks and have failed to directly address that. So to your point, I would love to see the other side of the aisle condemn one of their own for their own anti-Semitic remarks. I would like to take my time to yield to uh, Ms. Owens. If there's anything that's been said, I'm the last Republican here. So if there's anything that you would like to respond to, I'd like to give you uh, the balance of my time to do that. Uh, yes, I actually wanted to respond to Congressman Cicilline um, because he was making references to me, and I, and I thought that was a bit cowardly. Um, he said uh, he was dishonest when he said that the president refused to condemn white nationalism. Mr. Potts just literally gave the exact quote, the president doing just that. Uh, he does not want to accept the reality that the president has under multiple occasions condemned white supremacy and white nationalism. And the best condemnation of that is in the president helping the black community every single day with his policies. He also brought up family separation. This seems to only be an issue um, uh, for illegals at the border, and nobody ever wants to talk about black babies being separated from the womb of black mothers. So if he actually cared about that, he would be embracing me. And lastly, he brought up the rhetoric of the president um, as in the same breath that he referred to me as despicable. I'm tired of hearing the left refer to people as despicable, as deplorable. We are Americans and we are patriots. And even if we disagree with you, name calling should not be something that is done, especially in, in, in these chambers. Of all the people that Republicans could have selected, they picked Candace Owens. I don't know Miss Owens. I'm not going to characterize her. I'm going to let her own words do the talking. So I'm going to play for you the first 30 seconds of a statement she made about Adolf Hitler. I agree. I, I actually don't have any problems at all with the word nationalism. I think that it gets, uh, the definition gets poisoned. Um, by uh, elitists that actually want globalism. Globalism is what I, what I don't want. So when you think about whenever we say nationalism, the first thing people think about, in, at least in America, is Hitler. You know, he was a national socialist. But if Hitler just wanted to make Germany great and have things run well, okay, fine. The problem is, is that he wanted, he had dreams outside of Germany. He wanted to globalize. He wanted everybody to be German, everybody to be speaking German. All right, so my uh, first question is to Ms. Hershenoff. Ms. Owens said, quote, if Hitler just wanted to make Germany great and have things run well, okay, fine. The problem is that he wanted, he had dreams outside of Germany. So when people try to legitimize Adolf Hitler, does that feed into white nationalist ideology? It, it does, Mr. Liu. I know that uh, Ms. Owens distanced herself from those comments later, but we expressed great concern over the original comments. Great, thank you. Those of you who are watching the whole hearing, you may have noticed that Candace Owens was tweeting after that man played that recording. For those of you who are wondering what she was tweeting, if you haven't caught it, here we have. For those watching, are you noticing how every Democrat Congress member that mentions me refuses to let me respond to their claims? It's because they know they are being dishonest and lying. They are shutting down my speech because they know I will expose their lies. Moving on. Mr. Reschenthaler from Pennsylvania. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Owen. Uh, Ms. Owens, I'm sorry, we just started a recording. Um, would you like time to respond to that? Yes, um, I think it's pretty apparent that uh, Mr. Liu believes that black people are stupid and will not f uh, pursue the full clip in its entirety. He purposely presented an extract, an extracted Witness, clip. Witness will suspend for a moment. It is not proper to refer disparagingly or to a member of the committee. Uh, the witness will not do that again. Witness may continue. Sure, even though I was called despicable. Um, Witness may not refer to a member of the committee as stupid. I didn't refer to him as stupid. That's not what I said. That's not what I said at all. You, you didn't listen to what I said. May I continue? Please. As I said, he is assuming that black people will not go pursue the full two-hour clip. 
and he purposefully extracted, he cut off and you didn't hear the question that was asked of me. He's trying to present as if I was launching a defense of Hitler in Germany when in fact the question that was asked of me was pertaining to whether or not I believed that Hitler was a, whether or not I believed in nationalism and that nationalism was bad. And what I responded to was that I do not believe that we should be characterizing Hitler as a nationalist. He was a homicidal, psychopathic maniac that killed his own people. A nationalist would not kill their own people. That is exactly what I was referring to in the clip, and he purposely wanted to give you a cut up similar to what they do to Donald Trump to create a different narrative. That was unbelievably dishonest, and he did not allow me to respond to it, which is worrisome and should tell you a lot about where people are today in terms of trying to drum up narratives. By the way, I would like to also add that I work for Prager University, which is run by an Orthodox Jew, and a single Democrat showed up to the embassy opening in Jerusalem. I sat on a plane for 18 hours to make sure that I was there. I'm deeply offended by the insinuation of, of revealing that clip without the question that was asked of me. All right, that's it for this video, folks. I'm gonna ask Tabby if she would go through some of the tweets about this with me. Donald Trump Jr. congratulated Candace Owens, as did Mike Cernovich. Others, no doubt, commented on it, and she tweeted about it later on and during the hearing. I don't know about you, but I'd love to hear Tabby's woman-splaining opinion on all this. One more thing, make sure you subscribe to us on BitChute because YouTube is phasing out channels like ours. Thanks for watching, everyone.